two nations against each other. Following orders. Fighting on behalf of their people. To the victor, the spoilers. It's only a game. But behind the image of football lies a history of coercion, corruption and manipulation by the three most powerful fascists of the 20th century. In uns Deutschland und hinter uns kommt Deutschland. Mussolini, Hitler and Franco exploited the popular appeal of football for the benefit of their fascist regimes. Mussolini corrupted referees and took over the organization of the 1934 World Cup. Under Hitler, the Nazis intimidated, threatened and even murdered footballers who refused to bend to their will. Franco ruthlessly manipulated the passions of Spain's bitterly divided football supporters. The dangerous relationship between fascism and football cast a shadow across Europe for much of the 20th century. The World Cup was inaugurated in 1930 as football became an arena for the expression of friendly competition between nations. Football was emerging as an international sport around which national identities would be molded and manipulated. The sport to represent nations on the world stage. But fascist dictators would soon turn football into an ideological battlefield. the relationship between fascism and football would start in Italy. On October the 28th, 1922, Italy's fascist party came to power. Within three years, Benito Mussolini had established Europe's first fascist dictatorship. Mussolini masterminded the rebirth of Italian power. Drawing on the imagery of the Roman Empire, his new Italians would once again take on the world. Questo aneddoto, chiamiamolo così, che riguarda proprio Mussolini, cioè il fatto che Mussolini doveva propagandare l'immagine dell'italiano nuovo, quindi coraggioso, prestante nel fisico, vigoroso, sportivo. Però fra tante immagini che ci vengono in mente, che tutti quanti conosciamo, Mussolini a torso nudo che scia al terminillo, poi va in aereo, guida le macchine, va a cavallo e fa lo schermidore, anche nuota, però con la palla al piede che gioca a calcio, no. Mussolini didn't like football himself, but as a former newspaper editor, he was acutely aware of the power of propaganda in shaping public opinion. He recognized that as the sport of the masses, he could use football to gain the support of a nation that he'd brutally coerced into fascism. Opportunity. Opportunity is the main word to explain the reason why this wedding between fascism and football worked well, particularly in the case of Italy. The government needed popular support, and popular support in Italy was there in football. Uber Gradella, goalkeeper for Rome's Lazio team, remembers the change of mood that swept across the country. Era tutto uno spirito diverso. Tutti si proveniva da quella gioventù fascista. C'era un, diciamo, un indottrinamento di, che era di, diverso di quello che è adesso. Eravamo inquadrati, avevamo una mentalità. Lo sport per noi allora era, era quello che più sultro poteva esserci. Che sentivo all'essere l'ino della patria era una cosa diversa, era, sentiamo, ti emozionavi. 
Mussolini was handed the perfect opportunity to exploit the emotional appeal of football when the second World Cup tournament was held in Italy in 1934. Before the game commences, the great Italian crowd roars a welcome to Signor Mussolini. It was held in Italy and organised by Italy and therefore it offered an opportunity to show people what Italy was doing. It didn't just, in that famous phrase, make the trains run on time, but also that, that they could organise a good World Cup and organise also a victory for the Italian team. Mussolini took full control over the organisation of the 1934 World Cup. He was determined to turn it to Italy's advantage at every opportunity. As if to confirm his authority over the tournament and to symbolize his own importance, Mussolini even created a special trophy to be presented to the winning team. He would do everything in his power to ensure that it remained in fascist Italy. What is very peculiar is the megalomaniac image of Mussolini. And the fantastic symbol for it is the Coppa del Duce, which is about six times as big as the World Cup itself. So after the World Cup, Jules Rimet, the chairman of FIFA, writes in his daily correspondence with his general secretary, well, I have the impression it's not FIFA really that did the World Cup, that's Mussolini himself that organized it. The Duce and the nation represented as one. And for the iconography is absolutely crucial. Not content with home advantage, Mussolini dictated which referees would officiate at each match. This would prove decisive in his quest for victory. Italy beat the United States 7-1 in the first round, but were taken to a replay by a strong Spanish team in the quarterfinals. The behavior of the referees immediately aroused suspicions of corruption after a series of contentious decisions in favor of Italy ensured they won the replay 1-0. Mussolini's intervention was working to perfection. The performance of the referees in both games against Spain was considered to be of such a poor standard by their home countries that they were suspended from duty when they returned from Italy. With Italy now through to the semi-finals, the nation was elated. Everything Mussolini had hoped for was being achieved. Propaganda in football works because everybody can see that when I say I'm the winner, it is true, I win. I'm not telling lies. But Italy's opponents in the semi-final threatened to upset Mussolini's plans. The Austrian team, the pre-tournament favourites, were renowned for their stylish play and prodigious talent. Their star player, Matthias Schindler, was one of the best centre-forwards in the world. Torrential rain had turned the Milan pitch into a quagmire, undermining the Austrian team's incisive passing game. But the Austrians had to fight against more than the rain and a determined Italian team. Mussolini's choice of referee for the semi-final was a young Swede, Ivan Eklund. Allegations persist that they had dinner the night before the game to talk over tactics. Joseph Bichan played for the Austrian team in that match. Until his death in 2001, he was convinced the game had been fixed. Předtím zápasem, co jsme hráli s Itálií, a tak pozval Mussolini, který tenkrát byl někdo, jo, ten pozval toho švédského rozhočího, víte, aby nám to pískal. Tak on to taky pískal a pochopitelně, a podle Hugo Meisler, který to už věděl předem, že byl podplacený, no a, a proti nám pískal velmi, velmi špatně ve prospěch Itálie. Eklund turned a blind eye to the Italian team's aggressive, win-at-all-cost strategy, evident throughout the tournament. But this wasn't the only help he gave the Italians. No, ale on někdy hrál i s ním, a já když hrát třeba spas, jo, já hrát pravou spojku na to křídlo pravý naše, víte. No a tam běžel ten čížek nějaký, víte, tak ten rozhočí ho hlavou hrál zpátky, si představte. A hrálo se klidně dál. No, 
To strašni k neuvjerženju vůbec, jo? to je k neuvjerženju. Italy won 1-0, courtesy of another contentious goal that many people believe was offside, and more corrupt decisions from Mussolini's chosen referee. Italy were now through to the final. The new national stadium of the fascist party in Rome was said to be the scene of Mussolini's greatest propaganda triumph. Stadiums are places where you can show an idea of unity and dictators especially with Mussolini and Hitler, have been fascinated by stadiums and full stadiums. And probably that's the reason why football acquired such a high importance, because football feels stadium. Cheered on by the whole of Italy, the only thing that stood in Mussolini's way was a talented but relatively inexperienced Czechoslovakian team. Mussolini again insisted that Eklund, who had refereed the semi-final so clearly in Italy's favour, would referee the final itself, a situation that has never been repeated in any World Cup. Before the match, Eklund was even invited to the VIP box to meet Il Duce once again. Miloslav Jenschik, a Czech journalist, has spent the past 20 years investigating the corruption of the 1934 World Cup. For him, Mussolini's meeting with the referee was a defining moment for the morale of the Czechoslovakian team. Asi by nějak, pokud vůbec, tak z ceremonialu by asi vyplývalo pozvat si vedoucí obou týmů, možná s nimi rozhodčího, ale to samotné pozvání toho rozhodčího na naše hráče, když se o tom dozvěděli, působilo jako ledová sprcha a říkali, že prostě si to neuměli vysvětlit a že to jenom potvrzovalo jejich nejčernější obavy, protože věděli dobře, co se dělo v semifinalovém utkání e, Itálie Rakousko. The Czech team knew from the start they would have the Italian team, the crowd and most important of all, the referee against them. Throughout the game, the Italians aggressive style of play again went unpunished. Italy won 2-1 and were proclaimed world champions. The Italians win in Rome did more than anything else to cement the popularity of Il Duce. Erano le manifestazioni sportive delle vere e proprie liturgie perché effettivamente quella che viene soprattutto curata è l'immagine. Quindi come si poteva esaltare il periodo storico, un avvenimento, una manifestazione anche attraverso quello che era un vero e proprio rituale. Il fascismo a un certo punto diventa eh, una religione laica, quindi ecco lo spettacolo sportivo che diventa anche uno strumento politico poderoso. For the Italian people to celebrate victory was to celebrate fascism. Já si myslím, že aspoň ze známých ohlasů z té doby, já si myslím, že to italské vítězství ve finále nebo na celém světovém šampionátu v podstatě bylo obdobou toho, co se podařilo Hitlerovi, k čemu se podařilo Hitlerovi zneužít eh, olympijský her v roce 1936 v Berlíně, totiž jednoznačně propagaci fašistického státu, fašistického režimu. Mussolini's abuse of football didn't go unnoticed. Hitler, the master of propaganda, would take it to a new level, turning the manipulation of sport into an art. But the Nazis had a problem. The German football team of the early 1930s was no ambassador for Hitler's master race. The strong problem of Germany in that period is they didn't have a good team. There is, in the German case, a necessity to promote an image of strength and power of the nation. And to work, you need to have a good team. The Nazis couldn't hope to achieve the propaganda benefits that success in football had presented to Mussolini 
but Hitler would still use football to serve his own political ambitions. He now proclaims his contempt for world democracies. He withdraws Germany from the League of Nations. Hitler took Germany out of the League of Nations in October 1933, a move that alienated the Nazis from the international community. Football would give Hitler the opportunity to reassure his European neighbors and disguise his true intentions as he prepared Germany for war. The teams come out through lines of police, German and English players side by side, Germany white shirts. On December the 4th, 1935, the German football team traveled to London to play England, widely regarded as the best team in the world. Anti-fascist demonstrations failed to stop the match going ahead. The reason behind it was to show the international commu community, to show the British public that German people are no monsters, that Germans are civilized, that Germans can behave. England won 3-0, but even in defeat, Hitler exploited the event to his own advantage. And the best possible spirit prevails throughout the match. The British press acclaimed the performance of the German team and their supporters and the sporting spirit in which the game is played. And a third goal, this time Bastin is responsible, clinches the victory after a most sporting match. Well tried Germany. It wasn't so much a football match as a propaganda charade. Germany's footballers had lost, but in the words of the Führer's press officer, Guido von Mengden, Germany's political soldiers of the Führer had won. Before 1936, they tried to hide their real intentions. And football helped exactly to achieve that. The 1936 Berlin Olympics were the most successful exploitation of a sporting event for political ends in history. Hitler used the Olympics as an opportunity to showcase the impeccable organization of the German state the strength of Nazi ideology and the supremacy of its Aryan race. And the whole world was watching. Ich verkünde die Spiele von Berlin zur Feier der ersten Olympiade neuer Zeitrechnung als eröffnet. The German Olympic team won more medals than any other country. But Hitler watched in horror as the black American Jesse Owens raced to victory in the 100 meters. Four days later, Hitler was promised a stunning Olympic victory on the football pitch that would help to eclipse that humiliation. The Germans would play Norway, a team they were expected to beat with ease. The stage was set to reaffirm Germany's superiority, and Hitler was invited to enjoy the victory. The game against Norway at the Olympics was Hitler's first game he ever visited himself, and he was basically promised by the people around him that Germany would easily win. And then, well, his only game where he ever went to, uh, you know, it was a defeat, and it was a defeat against a nation which was seen as a lot weaker than Germany in football. Hitler immediately rose to his feet and left the ground. It was another public humiliation. His fury could only have been heightened by the fact that another German-speaking team were truly world-class. His native Austria had narrowly lost the Olympic final to Italy, and were one of the favorites for the forthcoming World Cup in 1938. The Austrians, known as the Wunder team, had contempt for German football. In 1931, they had twice demolished them, 6-0 and 5-0. While the German team was rigid, disciplined and inflexible, the Austrian team was fluid, artistic and subtle. They had won respect on the world stage for their stylish and inventive play. Matthias Schindler was the Austrian team's star player and a national hero. Nicknamed the paper man for his slight physique, his prowess in front of goal was the making of a Viennese legend. He inspired poetry 
and even enjoyed a cameo in a feature film. In a recent poll, he was voted Austria's greatest sportsman of the 20th century. Schindler was the David Beckham of his era. Conosceva molto bene la palla. Ecco perché le dico che è un uomo che si può paragonare ai grandi giocatori del calcio proprio che che hanno dato lustro, che hanno insegnato il calcio e che ha fatto innamorare il pubblico di vedere giocare. More than any other footballer, Schindler's life would be blighted by the manipulation of football by fascism. Egon Ulbrich grew up with Schindler on the streets of Favoriten, a town near the Czech-Austrian border. In the 1930s, they both worked for the Austria-Vienna Football Club. I was secretary of Austria. Schindler was the middle stürmer of Österreich. And that was Karl Flavo, the European Meister in Leichtgewicht in Boxing. Schindler. Ich kann nur wiederholen, dass er einer unserer besten und liebsten Spieler war. Mehr kann, das ist, kann mir nicht noch mehr aus der Als von allen vergöttert worden. Nicht nur vom Anhang, auch von den Gegnern. Weil die haben auch mit dem Team, mit dem wir miteinander Und das war so ein Schall, der hätte ohne, ohne den Mosel nicht leben können. Nicht? Und der Vogel eins auch nicht. Und da, Schindler's fame wasn't confined to Austria. He was coveted by Europe's top clubs, including Manchester United. But he had no intention of leaving his beloved Vienna. It's said that he was, uh, you know, that Schindler was the, the best uh, centre forward of the world. He's got his genius in his feet. And only when the ball hits the net, you, you, you just uh, can see what, what kind of, of, of highly complex structure the whole action of Schindler had. You know, floating like paper. In March 1938, Germany annexed Austria. Hitler's Wehrmacht commandeered state institutions and buildings and plundered national art collections. Annexation also offered an irresistible opportunity for the Nazis to build up the German football team by forcibly recruiting Austria's star footballers. Hitler wanted to build a team that would erase the memories of his footballing humiliation at the Olympics. The 1938 World Cup would be an opportunity to present to the world an all-conquering united Germany with the added talents of the Austrian Wunder team. The Nazis relished the fact that the star of their combined team would be the legendary paper man, Matthias Schindler. But there was a problem. Schindler despised the Nazis and their annexation of his homeland. He detested the Aryans only policy which had driven all the Jewish officials out of his club, Austria-Vienna. Schindler became a symbol for a new kind of relationship between fascism and football. Football became uh, the first vehicle to express resistance. You know. It became a means of politics. But uh, uh, this is an historical irony, as it uh, was designed by the Nazis as a means of politics, you know, it became a means of resistance too. Despite intimidation and threats from Hitler's Reich Sports Office, Schindler refused to play for the newly combined German team. But the Austrian team was forced to face the fact that it would be absorbed into the German team and effectively cease to exist. Their final game as an independent nation was a supposedly friendly match against Germany. Schindler was captain. There was this big game, kind of the farewell game to the Austrian football team in 1938. 
The game was meant to be a symbol of the fraternity of the two nations. The Nazis wanted the match to be a propaganda victory for Germany, but Austria was still the better team. Some people believe that the Austrians were advised to lose. There were strong rumors going around that the Austrian team was not allowed to score because Schindler had 100% chances and he did nothing. He just turned away and shook his head and said no. In the second half, he actually scored a goal and his best friend Karl Sester scored for the second goal and then the both of them, they went before the VIP sector which was full of Nazi functionaries and we had a dance before them. So this was a, a kind of expression of, uh, of self-confidence, you know, a kind of expression of the underdog as against the big German Reich. This was something outstanding and something the Nazis never forgave Schindler. Within a year, Schindler would pay a high price for his act of defiance. This is a publisher's uh, office now, but this used to be uh, Schindler's apartment, and it's actually still the same the way it was back then. The rooms haven't been renovated or anything back then. And there was the hallway. This was his bathroom. Sindela died at a very young age. He was only 36 years old. Uh, there were many rumors uh, concerning his death. Uh, I've heard that he might have been murdered, but who knows. Matthias Schindler died on January the 23rd, 1939. The circumstances of his death remain a mystery. Egon Ulbrich was with him in his coffee house on the evening of his death. It was a night in his coffee house, a riesen schnapsere, a so called schnapsere, a tiplere. But there were so many times in the end, they had to be able to get out of the way. They had to be able to get out of the way. They had to be able to get out of the way. They had to be able to get out of the way. After leaving the coffee house, Schindler visited his Italian girlfriend, Camilla Castagnola. They emptied a bottle of wine together and fell asleep. They would never wake up. They had been poisoned by carbon monoxide fumes. Castagnola went into a coma from which she never recovered. Schindler died as he slept. It was a kind, kind of a symbol for uh, for Viennese football that Matthias Schindler died in 1939, you know, the most outstanding character of the Vienna football died under circumstances that were never totally cleared up. Many suspected foul play. There was an inquest into the deaths, but the official reports were lost, mislaid during the Nazi occupation. What is certain is that the Nazi secret police had targeted Schindler and his family. Well, there's a Gestapo file on Schindler and his sisters saying uh, that the whole family was uh, uh, Czech national, uh, pro-Jewish and, and social democrat. This is a statement very close to a death sentence. It is very well possible that the Nazis played a role in Sindela's death because he was a symbol for Austrian patriotism as well. So he was definitely a dangerous person 
for this whole merging process. In the absence of official records from the time, the real cause of Shindara's death has been the subject of dispute and speculation ever since. To many in Austria, whether directly or indirectly, the Nazis killed Schindler, one of the greatest footballers in the world. For me, it was clear that Schindler committed suicide because he uh, couldn't live anymore uh, as long as he couldn't play football anymore. The moment he wasn't able to express himself by that game and by his interpretation of the game, uh, he was forced to commit suicide. Without definitive evidence to establish whether it was murder or suicide, Schindler's death has been registered as an accident since 1939. For the first time, Schindler's friend has revealed the extraordinary cover-up which led to the verdict of accidental death being recorded. The Kurzich was the Bürgermeister. It is then going on the Feststellung, wo es ist. The Kurzich hat gesagt, ihr wollt unbedingt ein Staatsbegräbnis haben. Das ist schwer gewesen. Da hat er gesagt, dann zu, ich könnte den Tätern gerne helfen, ich weiß, das Schindler geht auch in Ordnung, aber ich kann nicht, weil das Gesetz in Deutschland nach deutschen Recht the Nazis can a murder or a murder or a self-murder can be a grave. They must do something to make sure that the criminal death from the side of the road. We have a cop, a Wachmann, a revue inspector, a crazy revue inspector, who was a long girl. He was a bad Nazi, but not a girl. Und die ist zu uns gekommen, war alles in Ordnung. Der hat mir geholfen dann. Hat er gesagt, ich werde es machen. Ich werde es schon mit den Kollegen tun. Das wird ein Unfall. Und es war ein Unfall geworden. Ist einer gewesen durch die Rauchgasentwicklung von den Oben. Schindler was given the state funeral his friend had set out to achieve. 15,000 mourners dared to line the streets to pay their respects to one of Austria's most powerful symbols of anti-fascist resistance. Every year, people came to, to celebrate this day of death. Friedrich Taubeck uh, once said um, uh, he's loved by uh, every Viennese who knows him. That means he's loved by every Viennese. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. Britain was by now engaged in a policy of appeasement towards Germany. Football helped to project an air of normality in a volatile and uncertain climate. Two months after Germany's annexation of Austria, England travelled to Berlin to play Germany. 115,000 spectators packed the Great Olympic Stadium and are rewarded by an orgy of scoring. The result, 6-3 to England, was good for English morale, but it did nothing to dent German prestige. To lose to England at that time was nothing unusual because basically everybody lost to the British team at the time. Uh, so I think for Hitler, uh, the propaganda effect of that game was a lot more important than everything else. The game was used to reassure the British public that Germany wasn't the aggressor that everyone feared. For England to play football in Berlin legitimized Hitler's regime. The British government was subjected to a lot of pressure to stop the game taking place but refused to do that. In fact, interestingly enough, they said we, we can't do that because we don't intervene in sport, whereas, of course, we know that was not, not so. But that was the main reason they gave for, for not stopping the game. And, of course, the, in their uh, internal discussions, that they admitted that one of the reasons they didn't want to stop the game really was because it would go against the whole policy of appeasement. The British government colluded with the Nazis and asserted the policy of appeasement on the football pitch when images of the English team giving the Nazi salute went around the world. 
and the English team in white shirts give the Nazi salute during the German national anthem. For the British government, I think that uh, game had uh, an important political role, which was to support the appeasement policy of Neville Chamberlain, which then led to the Munich Treaty, which meant that Germany was allowed to invade Czechoslovakia. The England team were advised to give the Nazi salute by the Foreign Office, a gesture made more galling by the fact that Hitler wasn't even present. It was widely criticized throughout the world as a dangerous endorsement of Hitler's Nazi regime. Only a month later, the 1938 World Cup was held in France. Hitler proclaimed that 60 million Germans will play in Paris. In a chilling precursor to an invasion only two years later, Italy and Germany marched into France in the name of football. In the first round, the newly combined German team, with five Austrians in the starting 11, were drawn to play against their neutral neighbors, Switzerland, a team they were expected to beat. A one-all draw in the first game resulted in a replay. Germany quickly took a 2-0 lead. But the longer the game went on, the more apparent it became that even on the same team, Austrians and Germans preferred to play against each other. The Swiss scored four times against a German team that disintegrated under the pressure. The team the Nazis wanted to show off to the world was eliminated before the World Cup had really begun. It was another footballing humiliation for Hitler. The defending champions, Italy, were drawn against the hosts, France, in the second round. As the ultimate provocative gesture, Italy came out onto the football pitch wearing the black shirts of fascism. Ma il nero nasce molto semplicemente perché il segretario generale del fascio, un certo Starace, suggerisce a Mussolini di dare uno schiaffo ai francesi dicendo facciamo giocare la nazionale italiana con la maglia nera e Mussolini dice ah che bella cosa facciamolo 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 e decide evidentemente di far giocare con la maglia nera. Even with a hostile French crowd against them, Italy had a decisive 3-1 victory in pursuit of a second world crown. The Italians went on to retain the World Cup, beating Hungary 4-2 in the final. It was another massive propaganda victory for Mussolini. Spain had been a notable absentee from the 1938 World Cup. The country was being torn apart by a bloody civil war between leftist Republicans and a coalition of nationalist forces led by Francisco Franco. The Spanish Civil War brought together the three most powerful fascist leaders of the 20th century. Viva Italia! Viva Mussolini! In 1937, Mussolini sent 50,000 Italian army conscripts, along with air and naval units, to support his fascist ally. At the same time, Hitler's Luftwaffe would devastate the defenseless city of Guernica. Their interventions proved decisive. By 1939, Franco had quelled the last outposts of Republican resistance, including the capital of Catalonia, Barcelona. But with the demise of his fascist allies after the Second World War, Franco was left politically isolated. By remaining neutral throughout the war, though implicitly supporting Hitler, Franco's fascist regime managed to survive. But at a price. España, que vivía bajo el franquismo en un, eh, absolutamente aislada del mundo, 
sin ningún tipo de expansión internacional, en un país absolutamente recluido en, en su miseria política, culpabilizado además por, por, por el apoyo que había recibido Franco de los, de los gobiernos fascista italiano y nazi y alemán, evidentemente eh, necesitaba algún tipo de bandera, cualquiera le, le servía y no tenía banderas a la vista, era un país pobre, era un país eh, donde sus eh, élites intelectuales habían tenido que exiliarse después de la guerra, eh, evidentemente estaba en una situación verdaderamente desastrosa. Like Mussolini and Hitler, Franco initially had little interest in football, but he quickly realized that football could help him consolidate his control over Spain. He adopted the capital's major football club, Real Madrid, as the symbolic embodiment of his fascist dictatorship. Barça, the Barcelona football club, would become the focus of republican resistance against Franco's regime and its oppression of Catalan culture. Es indissociable la vida de Catalunya en el segle XX de la vida del Barça. Y muchas vegades el Barça ha sido un substitutori de, de Catalunya cuando no se podía enseñar la nuestra bandera o no se podía hablar la nuestra lengua. El Barça ha sido sovint una materia on arrelar-nos eh, para la pobre y oprimida Catalunya. Cuando Gary Lineker joined Barcelona en 1986, he quickly learned about the bitter legacy of the Franco years. I remember when I arrived in Barcelona, I wasn't really aware of the, um, the rivalry between Madrid and Barcelona at all, um, except the fact I knew there were two huge clubs, but uh, I was made uh, very aware very quickly um, of the intense rivalry, and you could describe it as hatred. Barcelona's antipathy to Real Madrid was burned into the city's consciousness by its experience of Franco's dictatorship. Franco was a cruel and vindictive leader who showed no mercy to his enemies. Barcelona still retains the scars of a civil war where life was cheap. Bullet holes riddled the church walls that were used as a backdrop for the routine massacres of the thousands executed in the name of fascism. No one in Spain was safe. The cold-blooded murder of the president of Barcelona Football Club Josep Suñol, in 1936, was one of the defining moments of Catalan nationalism and the region's struggle for independence. To this day, his memory is honored by a football society created in his name. Its president, Frances Gordo, still remembers the day Suñol died. I was a man and I was very hard work, and I always put it in front of the camera, in front of the things that I did, and I always put it in front of the camera, Nada nunca fue en Catalló. Y yo no habría tenido cap trascendencia. Pero va a tener mucha trascendencia porque cuando lo van a matar, no para un día para ir a casa y me dice, ¿sabes que el señor que te había pagado un Catalló? Pues ya no te podrá pagar porque lo acaban de matar. Lo van a matar, van a fugir, van a matar, van a asesinar allí. Suñol's death was brought about by a very simple but fatal mistake. Nada un coche en la bandereta catalana a prop de la Serra de Guadarrama es va pensar que estava en zona republicana, va entrar en zona franquista, amb una casilla de la muerte va parar eh, per fer un riu, va entrar dient viva la república i es va trobar que tots els de dintre eren de l'exèrcit espanyol. Van matar amb ell, el periodista que anava amb ell, el xofer i un sergent de la Guàrdia Republicana. Suñol's murder fueled the growing hostility and hatred towards Franco and by extension the team he chose to represent him. Real Madrid. It was felt that Real Madrid represented fascist Spain and Franco, and regions like Catalonia, where the people felt they were oppressed and um, fought in the Spanish Civil War uh, against Franco's fascism. Um, it was sort of a, the, 
they weren't allowed to speak their own language, um, and the only place that they did um, turned out to be the football ground. So the team came to represent Catalonia. Podíem cridar, no ens deixaven portar banderes, que se levantaven, que les prenien, però aquestes coses són que jo les banderes no les he nostrit tan mai. Els han saltat, sí, eh? Han cridat, han tret alguna bandera, han anat a la policia, els han tingut, les banderes les he portat posades en el cor, i per tant ja en tinc prou. Franco was so sly and manipulative that even Hitler remarked that he would rather have his teeth pulled than have to meet him again. Franco would deploy this slyness to turn the antagonism between Real and Barca to his own advantage. Franco, inicialment, el futbol no li importava gaire, però es va donar a partir d'un cert moment que li servia no només com a distracció i opi del poble, sinó com a element propagandístic del seu real, gran Real Madrid i de la seva Espanya. Franco propelled fascism's powerful relationship with football into a new era. The advent of television created even greater opportunities for the manipulation of football. Franco intervened to ensure that games were broadcast on television, to keep people off the streets at times when social unrest was anticipated. Quan el Franco, o la dictadura del Franco, o el govern del Franco, tot l'estament franquista tenia un problema polític en qualsevol lloc d'Espanya, de seguida hi havia un partit important el qual se'l robava, que se'n deien llavors. I això alterava els nervis i alterava, i era tan gros l'alteració pública d'aquell robo, perquè llavors s'amagava la importància política d'aquell fet concret que hi havia hagut. At first, Real Madrid's adoption by Franco failed to translate into success on the pitch. Between 1939 and 1954, Madrid didn't win a single Spanish league title. Barcelona won five. The transfer to Real Madrid of the Argentinian Alfredo Di Stefano would soon enable Franco to redress the balance. It would become one of the greatest scandals in football history. In the 1950s, Di Stefano, also known as the Blond Arrow, established his reputation as one of the greatest football players of all time. He was the star player of the Colombian team Millonarios, scoring 267 goals in only 292 games. Now 77, Di Stefano is the honorary president of Real Madrid. He recently handed the white shirt of Madrid to David Beckham, and the England captain signed for them after being courted for months by Barcelona. The poaching of Beckham by Real out of the hands of Barcelona has echoes of Di Stefano's own controversial transfer almost 50 years earlier. Y vinimos a jugar con millonarios el, el centenario del Madrid. Y ganamos nosotros, ganamos el, el Madrid el torneo. Después nos volvimos a Colombia y yo, ahí donde se, se interesaron los del Madrid. Bueno, cuando yo vine aquí se interesaron por traerme a, al club, ¿no? No, no, porque me hablaron ellos. Me hablaron ellos. Entonces decidí venir aquí. El Barcelona también estaba interesado. Y no se pudo concretar por cuestiones de... de these bureaucratic issues would seal Real Madrid's pact with Franco. Barcelona had made the first move to recruit De Stefano. His signing would have consolidated their superiority over Franco's Real Madrid and boosted the morale of their oppressed supporters. Negotiations advanced smoothly at first. De Stefano had even played three friendlies for Barca. He was on his way to Spain, but Franco would do everything in his power to ensure that the blonde arrow would wear the shirt of Real. Però, què va passar, i aquesta és la clau de tot? El president del Barça li van fer xantatge. En un hotel de Madrid, una nit, 
el van detenir, se'l van emportar i li van dir que les seves empreses de filatura tèxtil tindrien unes inspeccions fiscals que no se'n sortiria si no cedia el Di Stefano al Madrid. Això, la importància era el real decret. La importància que fixés el Di Stefano pel Madrid va ser per real decret. Allò, dic per real decreto perquè el prestigi i la dignitat de la persona fer molt important. El fallo havia de ser que havia de ser jugador de Barcelona. After protests from Barcelona, a deal was brokered, proposing that Di Stefano should play alternate seasons for Barcelona and Real Madrid. It was a ludicrous compromise. Era una cosa surrealista i la directiva, el president del Barça, en vam posar una altra, va dir nosaltres això no ho podem acceptar, que se'l quedin ells per ells va el pollastre. És una frase històrica però que ens ha fet molt mal. Barcelona may have played their hand badly, but they were fighting against the wishes of the most powerful man in the country. The issue was duly resolved. Less than a month later, Di Stefano walked out on the famous turf of Madrid and scored four goals against Barcelona. Yo políticamente, yo jugué bien en todo lado. Para la gente. Yo no, no, no he ganado un partido para llevar una bandera política, de ninguna manera. The role of Di Stefano uh, in uh, Frankist Spain is crucial because that's a country that will use the best player in world football at that period uh, as an example of a normalized situation. And Di Stefano will completely changed the image of Spain internationally. In record, almost single-handedly accounted for Real Madrid winning the European Cup, the greatest prize in club football, five successive times between 1956 and 1960. We have opened doors. Yes, we have opened doors. We have tried to unify, without knowing, who knows. We didn't know it. We were young. Y no nos damos cuenta, pero la gente mayor que nosotros se habrá dado cuenta, ¿no? Pero verdaderamente pienso yo que para, el, para, la, para la parte que corresponde a España, eh, el Madrid ha sido un embajador, ¿no? El fútbol le permitió a través del Real Madrid vender algún tipo de imagen. Eh, lo consiguió a través de un equipo que ganó cinco, eh, cinco Copas de Europa. En este sentido, es evidente que al régimen le vino perfectamente bien eh, la utilización del Real Madrid como imagen in, eh, en el extranjero. Franco was riding the wave of Real Madrid's success. It created a glamorous and modern image of Spain that he would be sure to use to his advantage. Franco is probably the dictator which, more than anybody else, understood how Football could be important uh, in international relations. The international context is different. We are talking about the post-Second World War, Cold War. Uh, the nation is member of NATO, but the nation is completely excluded from the rest of Europe. Through Real Madrid and through the creation of the European Cup, uh, the Spanish state is reintegrated into the world. Franco went on to use football in the greater international and political arena as a way of antagonizing his old enemies in the Soviet Union and currying favor with the United States at the height of the Cold War in the 1960s, who would also come to play for Real Madrid. In the qualifying rounds of the 1960 European Championships in France, Spain were drawn against the Soviet Union, one of the best teams in the world. The Soviets had provided funds to Catalonia in its battle against Franco during the Civil War, and he detested them above all others. He was reluctant to risk a defeat and withdrew Spain from the championships. Four years later, Spain were the hosts and were again due to meet the Soviet team. This time the encounter couldn't be avoided, 
the match was the final of Europe's most prestigious tournament. To withdraw would be an international embarrassment for Franco. The football pitch became the arena in which the competing ideologies of communism and fascism would be judged. Sí que se estableció un partido, un partido de fútbol como, como algo más que un partido. El hecho de que la final se jugara con Rusia, con lo que eso significaba, de todos los fantasmas interiores del franquismo estaban representados en aquel equipo de Yasin, y evidentemente había una especie como de consigna, este partido hay que ganarlo como sea, hay que instruir a la gente que el enemigo no es un equipo, es... Eh, la Unión Soviética es lo que significa de, de malvado el, el comunismo. A long range header from the striker Marcelino sealed a 2 1 win for Spain and was yet another validation of Franco's fascist regime. Despite the oppression of Franco's fascist state and the resistance of Catalonia, Franco's manipulation of football helped to ensure he held a dictator's grip on Spain. Five, accountable, in his own words, only to God and to history. He was buried at Valle de los Caídos, the Valley of the Fallen, a vast shrine on the outskirts of Madrid to those who had died fighting under the banner of fascism and built by the forced labor of Republican prisoners. Se juega en el low camp de la ciudad condal el partido de fútbol entre el Barcelona y el Real Madrid. Barcelona played Real Madrid in the No Camp Stadium. 38 days after Franco's death, on the 28th of December, 1975. 700 Catalan flags were smuggled into the ground. Barcelona won 2-1. Never before had the No Camp faithful celebrated with such vigor. <laughs> 